Welcome to the Find My Catalyst podcast. We all have problems we're looking to solve, and we know that there are solutions out there, but we struggle with this. How do we find the solution? Where does that nudge come from to help us take the next step, start solving tough problems? That's the intention of this podcast, is to help you find your catalyst and take that next step. I'm Mike Simmons. I am the founder of Catalyst Sale, and I am really excited to have Tim Schurer on the podcast today. Tim is the author of the upcoming book, The Secret Society of Success. We'll have a great conversation around some of the content that's in the book. And I think one of the things you'll find out is you may already be part of that secret society based on the work that you're doing. This episode is brought to you by the Catalyst Sale Game Plan. It's our approach to goal setting and execution. If you head to findmycatalyst.com, you can find more information. Let's get to the discussion. Tim, it is awesome to meet you. We've met through Jody Mayberry. Jody is the host of this show when he comes on and he'll interview me from time to time. And then in the background, he takes he and his team take care of all of the post-production stuff. And he always is connected with really, really good people. So that's how we met. One of the connections that we've had though for a long period of time, and folks like Donald Miller and JJ Peterson have been on the podcast before, is the connection to Story Brand, because it's One, a fascinating book. It's a fascinating perspective to take when thinking about how do you engage with others, but then moving into some of the business made simple stuff. So let's just start with a book that you have just released, The Secret Society of Success. What problem is this book solving for in the world? So I'd love to, you know, first start with talking about Apollo 11. I love this story, and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with it. You have Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But what a lot of people don't know, there's actually a third astronaut on that mission, and his name was Michael Collins. So here you have Michael Collins, the guy Ubers, (laughs) Neil and Buzz to the moon, drops them off so they can do the various tasks on the moon surface while he stays with the command module and then orbits the moon something like 26 times until the guys are ready to be picked up and brought back to Earth. And what would make it a pretty miserable story is if when Michael Collins gets back to sit down with the press, he would say something like, well, it sure would have been nice to actually walk on the moon. You know, acted like a victim and some way tried to steal the spotlight away from the mission as a whole. But what's beautiful is he did not respond that way. And in fact, what he talked about was how content he was to have had one of those three seats. He was happy to be part of a team. So my question is, why is it that to be successful, we have to step into the spotlight, climb the ladder? Our business has to be the top when it comes to revenue as we compare our metrics against our friends' metrics, right? Like, is that what success is? Is it money, fame, power? And as I've actually navigated the last 10 to 15 years of my life trying to find a career, a life of meaning and purpose and fulfillment, it's almost that I've found those things the further I've gotten away from these cultural definitions of success. When they've said, step into the spotlight, I've actually said, well, I'm actually over here behind the scenes. Nobody knows my name. I'm contributing to this team, making an impact that way, and actually am finding a lot of happiness and contentment in that. So when we hear these messages that this is what success is, I just am sitting here thinking, surely there's just another path here and I don't think I'm alone. So there's a message that says, to be successful, you have to walk on the moon. And I'm like, I don't know because I just think the Michael Collins example is pretty fascinating. And so for me, I've discovered this secret society of people who I call the secret society of success that have shown me a new way to live and define success. And some of them are, you know, people like Michael Collins, who a lot of people may never have heard of, but there's also several examples of people who are very well known. And so what I've learned is the secret society is less about a position. It's not your place on the org chart. It's more the posture, the mindset that you, you operate out of as you go about doing your work. And that is the thing that I'm hoping to you know, introduce people to. And ultimately, I want people to be able to redefine success in a way that is actually more sustainable, more fulfilling than maybe all the noise they're hearing right now. So what about the person out there who wants to be John Mayer? 
<laughs> of like me, you know, what I wanted to do when I was growing up. That's it. So when I was in college, I wanted to be the next John Mayer. I wanted to see my name in lights. I wanted to be famous. And at the time, you know, I just saw it as a big goal, right? Like I was starting to write some songs. I had turned some of those songs into recordings, made my own CDs. I was living in Kansas City at the time, which is where I grew up. And I was hosting concerts and inviting everyone I knew to come to these shows. And this is the new dream for me. This is what I wanted to do. And what I found was that I was very unsuccessful in that pursuit. It wasn't working for me. And it was confusing and frustrating because I was trying to make this business work and I just wasn't getting traction. You know, I, I read a, a book, Chip and Dan Heath had this book called Made to Stick. And there's a question in there that just haunted me. It says, are you demanding or attracting attention? And I just, in that season of my life, I was demanding attention. I was doing whatever I could to get people to notice me, to pay attention, and it wasn't working. So at that time, I was caught in you know, what I now call the spotlight mindset, this unhealthy desire for attention and recognition. And the spotlight mindset is actually something that a lot of us are up against. And if we don't learn to identify the spotlight mindset in our own lives and then learn what to do about it, it actually can lead us on some pretty destructive paths. And so there's a few symptoms of the spotlight mindset that I talk about in the book, but I'll talk about a couple of them here because my hope is that anybody listening, you'll likely spot some of these in your life. All of us are up against this spotlight mindset in some way, shape, or form. You know, so here's a, a big one, you know, striving. Do you struggle to find contentment in your life? Does it lead you on a restless pursuit for more? right? This whole thing that's like, no matter what you have, it's never enough. There is always another tier to chase after, right? You have 15 employees while well, your neighbor has 50, right? They're doing 5 million in revenue. You want 15, you know? So it's just this whole thing where there's always something else to strive after. So striving is a symptom of the spotlight mindset. Comparison is another one. Do you wish you were someone else wondering how your success stacks up against others. Another is damaged relationships. Does money, fame, or status trump other things in your life? Are your relationships suffering because of it? And there's a, a guy that I'm actually, I've learned a lot from over the years. His name's Michael Hyatt. He's a you know, best-selling author, speaker. He runs a business as well. And um, so this was several years ago, but Michael was given the opportunity to run an imprint at a publishing company, a book publishing company. So, you know, another way to look at it is there's 14 different divisions under this umbrella at the publisher. And, you know, he was given the opportunity to run one of those divisions. So that particular division was ranked 14th out of 14 when it came to all the significant metrics, revenue, team morale, everything was at the, you know, very bottom. So he told the then CEO, give me three years, I'm going to turn this thing around. Well, only 18 months, Michael actually facilitated this turnaround. Nelson Books, the division he was leading, was now at the top. Team Morale was at an all-time high. Revenue was where it needed to be. And here Michael was sitting with the largest bonus check he'd ever received. And in fact, he says it was larger than his annual salary. He couldn't wait to get home, talk to his wife about it. She was his biggest fan. He knew she would be thrilled. And then he sits down with his wife when he gets home and she says, we need to talk. And with tears in her eyes, she says, your five daughters need you now more than ever. And in fact, I feel like a single parent. And that was just a huge gut punch because here he was, Michael, experiencing all the success that other people would tell us to chase. He had turned the company around. He was leading a really high performing team. They were hitting revenue metrics that they had never hit before. He was walking home with a massive bonus check. And yet the things that mattered most to him were suffering. And I think that to me is the symptom of a spotlight mindset, a faulty definition of success. If we don't learn how to define it for ourselves, these faulty definitions of success, the way that we view things impact our behaviors, right? And if we don't have a clear definition, one that is actually better than the one that we're operating out of today, almost the one that is being handed to us by culture, 
we are potentially going to be set up for some really destructive stuff. So the spotlight mindset, this unhealthy desire for attention and recognition, why it is that we do the thing that we do, we need to pay attention to all of the potential you know, symptoms so that we can learn to correct it and ultimately step into a, a better way of living. And so here I was wanting to be the next John Mayer. Things were not working. I was demanding attention, not attracting it. I was caught in the spotlight mindset. And it's not until you know I started to identify some of this and really start to figure out what it was that I was attracting attention doing that led me to stepping into a different role. I actually abandoned this career path and, and actually started working behind the scenes as a right-hand man to, you know, a couple different people. And, you know, one of those was Donald Miller. And now here we are 10 years later, and I've been a part of helping build some really beautiful things as a part of the team. But I stopped being so concerned about being noticed and recognized and fell in love doing the work itself. And that's when I really started to gain some attraction in my career but it's been a total mindset shift that I've been, you know, going on over the last, you know, 15 years since I wanted to be John Mayer. Nothing against John Mayer. The guy's incredible. Actually, I love it. But it really, the problem was my intention for wanting all these things. So I'm sure there's someone who's, there, there are a number of people who, as they're listening to the conversation, they're thinking, wow, I'm there. I'm in this, I'm in this rut. I'm in this space where I'm just continuing to work really, really hard, but the wheels are just spinning. I'm not feeling that level of fulfillment. I'm negatively impacting relationships inside inside my home and outside of my home. I feel disconnected. What are some questions that people can ask themselves so that they can start working through this process of saying, what's meaningful? Where how do I find fit? What are some things that that we can do? to hit the pause button so that we don't keep spinning our wheels and start to get back on that path. So these questions that we ask is really impacted by the world that we operate in. We live in a very consumerism. It like consumerism has just impacted us so much. If you're running a business in order to sell your products or sell your services, you know, as a marketer, you have to present everything that you offer through the lens of what's in it for me, because that's exactly what your customers are buying. They want to know how it is going to make their life better. What is your product or service going to do to help them? Because of this, we are just being bombarded day after day, you know, second after second sometimes with just these messages when we are caused to ask what's in it for me. And that what's in it for me mindset is the thing that can be very damaging if we actually apply it to other parts of our lives. And so I'm at this uh, event in Atlanta and there's a guy speaking there. His name's Andy Stanley. He's a leadership expert, amazing communicator. And the conference was around finding our purpose, right? And so, you know, in this, we're talking, okay, how do people find their purpose? How do we navigate all that we're up against to pursue lives of meaning and purpose and fulfillment. And he says, these questions, the what's in it for me, the, you know, why am I here? He says, these are the wrong questions because of how self-serving they can be, right? When we think, you know, it is all about us, that is often the beginning of some problems. He says, we all want to be the end. No one is willing to be the means to the end. They just all want to be the end. He says, the question we need to ask is, who am I here for? And that who am I here for question requires us to still show up and do our part to bring our gifts and skills and abilities. But the posture in which we show up is one in service of others. Who am I showing up for? Who am I here for? Right? In story brain language, this is a lot where we talk about you're not the hero, you're the guide, right? Mm -hmm. You're not Luke Skywalker, be Yoda, help someone else win. Yoda is operating out of this, who am I here for perspective, right? So Tim Cook takes over as CEO of Apple. And before he was CEO, he was actually COO under Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs passes away. The person that had been groomed to take over is Tim Cook. So here we are at the release of the Apple Watch, which was the first new product in a new category 
that Apple had released since Steve Jobs had passed. So they had released other iPhones and other computers, but the Apple Watch was a brand new product. Yep. So this is a pretty big moment for everybody, right? They needed it to go really well. So Tim Cook's being interviewed on national television and David Muir asks him, is this the moment for you, the moment of your career at Apple? Now just think for a second how you would respond in that moment. Here you'd been behind the scenes, under the radar for several decades, contributing significantly to the success of a company like Apple. Nobody knows your name. You would probably want to use this as an opportunity to take some of the spotlight and leverage it to let everybody know, I am the man for the job. I can take this company to the next era. I have what it takes. That's what the spotlight mindset would cause you to respond with, right? Right. But that's not how Tim Cook responds. When asked, is this the moment for you, the moment of your career at Apple? He says, it's a moment for Apple. I don't really think about myself that much. And in that moment, I learned everything I needed to know about how Tim Cook shows up and how he leads. Those two sentences, to me, is operating with humble confidence. It's confidence in knowing the value that he's bringing to the table, but he doesn't need to let everybody know all that he's done. He doesn't need everybody to know all of that, you know, all of what he brings to the table to make this thing successful. He's willing to shine the spotlight on other members of his team, right? That humility to not take the spotlight, not take the bait in a moment that was just an alley-oop. He actually uses this as an alley-oop to, you know, set someone else up to win, to shine the spotlight on them. And there's this plaque that I actually have sitting on my desk, and it's a replica of a plaque that sat on Ronald Reagan's desk when he was president. And it says this, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit, right? So I think for all of us, as we're running businesses, leading teams, showing up for our customers, how do we avoid the spotlight mindset and actually start to live in a way that is more impactful, that's leading us towards more purpose and fulfillment? We start to ask these questions, who am I here for? We look at these opportunities that maybe we were you know, given some credit, some recognition and accolade. Are you going to use that to try to take all the credit for yourself? Or are you going to use that as an opportunity to walk with humble confidence and actually give credit away to somebody else, to let your team know how much you value and appreciate and recognize their contribution? I think that's the beginning. These are the decisions that we're up against. These are the decisions that we need to make to push us into a better and a, a more fulfilling and rewarding path. I think really, really powerful. The, the, the importance of that humble confidence is that confidence comes from experience, the knowing that you can do things and you've seen these things work. The humble piece is how do you present in a way, or how do you share information in a way that really reinforces it's not about me, it's about the team, because we don't get where we want to go without the team, without enabling others. And, and it took me a while to realize that that is an important role for me. I'm an enabler. And I stayed away from the word because when I was growing up, if you talked about enabling people, it usually meant that you were enabling their addiction to something. You were enabling negative things. Today, enabling is a really, really powerful thing. You enable others to accomplish what they want to accomplish, accomplish so much more than what they even thought was possible because they didn't realize some of the blocks that were out there. And it, you, know, you, you look at a lot of these roles. Uh, I mean, the, the most recent Marvel movie out there is, uh, the, is one of the Spider-Man ones. And you know, Ned is the guy in the chair. You know, there's a guy in the chair. We had Karen, who's the person who is in the suit talking in the ear. So I think it's really powerful to talk about this piece around enablement and knowing how important that role is. One of the things that you mentioned in the book is the idea of sheep bloat. And it was the first time I'd ever heard sheep bloat. What, what is sheep bloat? So I have a, a regular routine as I commute. I pop on podcasts. That's, I'm just listening all the time. And okay. I, there's a, a guy, Jason Strand, 
presenting this, you know, talk and, you know, he's the one that I learned sheet bloating from. And so sheet bloat is apparently, right? I'm, I'm, okay. Apparently, right? Like <laughs> I'm just trusting all the people and, and I've, I've gone online and actually even read more about this, but sheep, if left to their own devices, will eat so much that it can actually cause them to get sick. And you would think that if sheep were to eat something that would cause them to be sick, it was from something that is, you know, maybe poison or I don't know, some bad grass that they're eating, right? But what's interesting about sheep bloat is that's not the case at all. It's actually green pastures all around them. But shepherds know this, that if they eat too much, even of a good thing, it can cause them to get really sick. And they eat so much, they, the bloating part, they can actually die from this, which is insane, right? Yep. So not only is a shepherd's job to take sheep from grazing ground to grazing ground, it's actually to keep them from eating too much. And if they see and notice them eating too much, they force them to lie down, right? Okay. And so what can happen in all of us is if you think about where you are in your life, in your business, there are likely opportunities all around, green pastures everywhere, the opportunity to do and have and chase right? And so the question for us is, will we lie down ourselves or will we be forced to lie down? Because sometimes even that story of Michael Hyatt, he was forced to lie down. Right. You know, that conversation with his wife, that was her stepping in as a shepherd, just saying, this isn't it, right? Do our relationships have to be impacted for us to know that we've actually started to head down the wrong path, right? Do you have to actually go achieve, let's say you're a $5 million business, you want to get to 10. You spend years and hours just grinding to get to 10 and then you get to 10 and you realize, holy smokes, this feels the exact same way as five. (laughs) Right? It's like, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Right? But it's almost like we have to learn the hard way, right? And so what's interesting to me in Sheet Bloat is, you know, and even the the world that we live in, there is opportunity everywhere. There is a, a chase next opportunity for us. And the question that I have for all of us is, how are you defining success? And what is your intention behind wanting that? And let me be clear, ambition is a beautiful thing. I'm not trying to squash people's ambition. You know, for Michael Collins to have even had a seat on that mission meant he was best in class. He was one of the top three people to be able to even have the opportunity. That guy was ambitious, competitive, but I don't think that his intention, the posture that he went about doing his work was to get the accolade. He didn't need to get to a $10 million business so his friends would look at him and tell him he was successful. You know, maybe the business leader who gets to 10 million is doing it because it it actually provides them the opportunity to hire a bunch of staff to impact their lives and ultimately serve their customers and impact their lives for the better, right? Like we can actually chase 10 million and get there with, with two very different mindsets. The spotlight mindset is I'm going to, you know, be able to buy a nicer house, nicer car. People are, this is all about me. Or you look at it through the lens of who am I here for? How many more people then do you have to serve if you were to build a company like that? So you know, I love this story uh, around sheet bloating. There's a guy named Lee Lefever, and he created a, an explainer video that really just launched he and his business off. And, you know, so the, the video that he created, this was back in 2008, he created a video called Twitter in Plain English. So he used these like cardboard cutouts and it's this audio narration over him doing, you know, animation uh, with physical items right in front of him and, and just really explained in simple language what Twitter was all about. Twitter actually takes that video, puts it on the homepage of their site. It racks up millions of views. His next call is from Google. They want him to create a video called Google Docs in plain English. And all of a sudden now he's getting so many requests that he has a decision to make. What am I going to do with all these leads? What am I going to do with all of the opportunity, green pastures all around me, Right. He gets to say, okay, what is it that I value? How do I want to approach this? So he and his wife were business partners at the time, and they, they decided first and foremost that they were not going to hire any employees. 
They wanted to protect their relationship. They didn't want this thing to grow beyond what they could handle. They actually were pretty content with it just being the two of them. So they decided to actually start promoting and pushing leads to their competitors. (laughs) So they created what they called the Common Craft Explainer Network. And on their website, they listed several of their competitors and charged them a monthly fee to be listed in this directory. So here they they were making like $80,000 a year simply by making the decision to stay small and just push that extra work over to their competitors. And Lee actually has written a book that I actually really enjoy called Big Enough. And I think it's a great book for all of us to, you know, read and consider for ourselves as you're building a business How big does it need to be? What is your intention in trying to build and grow this thing? And if you have really healthy intentions to grow the business, hire a bunch of people, like go for it. That's totally fine. But maybe there's somebody out there that is feeling this like, man, I this whole idea of scaling is just, I just don't know if that's it for me. You get to define success for yourself. Keep our eyes on our own scorecard, right? Rather than letting somebody else's definition of success impact ours, we get to do whatever we want. This is your company, right? So for Lee, he made the decision that he was just going to keep it small. And, and he, in my opinion, forced himself to lie down. He wasn't forced to lie down, right? And I think that's the opportunity for all of us is checking our intentions whenever we're about to do anything and whenever we're about to make a decision as a business owner. That's the kind of stuff I think we need to be aware of. We need to be careful of sheet bloat. It is hard for, well, it's hard for someone like me to stop myself. And this is where a network of people around me, advisors, people who I trust can help me overcome some of the blind spots that I have around just going and going and going and going and going. And I think if the story that Tim has just shared here around sheep bloat and the importance of an intervention being there and you not being the person who can create that intervention for yourself, find a shepherd, find someone around you. Because I'm sure if you start asking questions, people will speak up, people will share, and people will engage. So really, really powerful. I had one we had never seen sheep bloat before, or heard of sheep bloat, but it resonates because you feel it, you know when you see it, and and you and you can see it out there. The Reagan plaque, I think, is really another really powerful reference and visualization, a reminder that remember president who had in his office, and I know you've already said this once, but I think it bears repeating. There's no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. What are some triggers or things that you put around yourself or that you think others can put around themselves? Well, let's talk about you. What do you put around yourself so that you are acutely aware that, hey, I'm drifting toward a spotlight mindset instead of who am I here for? approach. Do you have reminders around that keep you going other than you said the plaque? Are there other ones that you keep around you? The spotlight mindset is not a problem to solve. There is not one day that we are going to wake up and be like, guys, I did it. You know, I just, (laughs) it's kind of like exercise. You don't wake up one day and just say, I'm healthy. I did it. You made it to the end of the internet. Here we are. (laughs) Yeah. So, so the reality is we are going to live in the tension between the spotlight mindset and then the other side of it, which I would call living in the way of the secret society, we have to learn to live in that tension because every day there are going to be decisions that we're going to take steps in one of those two directions. So, I mean, this is a perfect example. I'm sitting here talking to you on this podcast and I have a decision Am I going to try to make this all about me? Am I hoping? Is my intention in doing this that you all will think that I am great, therefore, you know, whatever, right? Or am I going to show up and think, what can I say that will help these people maybe get it? 
that this idea of redefining success for themselves, if they can understand that and I can communicate that clearly, I'm able to bring and offer value. Whether or not people buy the book at the end of the day, I'm just not as concerned about that. I'm more in concern in showing up, offering value. I asked this even before we started, who are we talking to? Help me understand some of these people's problems, their headspace, because I want to be able to speak to them in a way that maybe they will understand and learn from some of the failures that I've had and you know, navigating the spotlight mindset. So I think every day I'm up against this just like everybody else. Yeah. We have to choose. This is a choice. We have to choose. Are we going to make this about us or are we going to be willing to set you know, somebody else up to win? And in 2020, LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers, they won the NBA finals. So they give a trophy to the team you know, at the end of the season, but they also give a trophy at the end of every NBA season to the scoring leader. And that's the person in the NBA who had the highest points per game average. Okay. It's a pretty big deal to be the scoring leader. Michael Jordan won this thing a record setting 10 times. So here you've got a guy like LeBron, one of the greatest NBA players of all time. He has all the talent in the world to win that scoring title. What's interesting to me is in 2020, he didn't win the scoring title. And in fact, he wasn't even in the top five. What I've been so inspired by is in 2020, LeBron led the league in assists, meaning the way that he chose to play the game and ultimately how he and his team won the NBA Finals was by him not taking over games and trying to do it on his own, but it was him actually setting his teammates up to score. And, you know, when I was uh, working at StoryBrand, I hired every single employee. And so one day there was a, an application that came through and on this person's resume was one of my favorite companies. I couldn't wait to talk to them about what it was like to work at this company. And if I said the name of the brand out loud to y'all, everyone here would know it. You've likely, you know, engaged in this brand in some way. You've probably owned some of their products. So I couldn't wait to talk to them in the first interview. I was like, all right, tell me everything, right? Like, what, what's it like to work there? And they said something I'll never forget. They said, it's a really competitive environment. Here's the thing, though. Nobody there has your back. And I was thinking, what do you mean nobody there has your back? And they went on to describe how everyone was so worried about their own promotion how they were setting themselves up to win, that they weren't willing to invest any time or allow you know, themselves to give anyone else credit because that would just look like somebody else being set up to take the position that they were also competing for. Nobody there has your back. Like that's never to be said of anybody in the secret society. The secret society doesn't walk with scarcity. It's not if you win, I can't win. The secret society lives and, and we define success more with abundance. Let me help somebody else win without really thinking too much about how that impacts me because I just believe you do enough of that, you know, the rest is going to take care of itself, right? So every day we're just up against these decisions where are we going to make it all about us? What's in it for me? Or are we going to show up, be all about the assist, you know, be thinking who am I here for? But we have to learn to live in that tension because it's not going away. So I will reinforce, go out and buy the book. You will enjoy the book. There are parts of the book that will speak to you in different ways. You'll find your thing as you go through it. So even though Tim is saying, hey, whether people buy it or don't buy it, let's deliver value in the conversation. You will find the book valuable. I did. There's a, this is a good shift in kind of transition into a collaboration over competition and you know, solving the problem of others. The, the note that I have here is Porter's call. And, mm -hmm. and I forget the context for which you brought up Porter's call, but I've got this kind of covered together in collaboration over competition, solving the problem of others and Porter's call. I believe Porter's call was a service to help well, but let's let you tell the story. So we yeah, can yeah. share a bit about Porter's Call. Yeah. My friend Al was running a private practice as a counselor, and he started noticing a unique trend. More and more often, he had the same group of people showing up, and it seemed as though they had the same kinds of problems. And he found these were a lot of musicians. And he was in Nashville. And so 
that's not too surprising, but you know, the fact is a lot of these musicians are trying to navigate what life in the spotlight, you know, all looks like. And it's a pretty unique thing to have to navigate that. So at the time, someone recommended that Al meet with a guy named Peter York. Peter was running a record label in Nashville. And the two of them sat down and, you know, Al said, y'all invest so much money into these artists' careers, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet you don't invest anything into their souls. Like, why are we risking failure time and time again? What if we could actually get at the root of some of this and help people navigate this part of their lives? Because in the end, it will, you know, create more sustainable careers for the record label and probably be better for them, you know, financially. But it's an investment. It's a mindset shift, right? And, um, Come to find out, Peter had been having a very similar conversation, had been challenged recently as a leader to go and try to tackle some of this. So when Al comes to him, it was just you know, further confirmation for the both of them, they were on the right track. They put together a beta program where you know, Al was going to carve out one day a week at his counseling practice. And you know, Peter said, here's the catch, I'll pay the bill but you have to be willing to accept any artist that I send your way, whether it's on my label or someone else's label. I was like, deal, let's do it. Let's meet back after this you know, period of time, this beta period. It's going extremely well. And you know, because of the record label footing the bill, the artist got to come for free, right? And so what was carving out one day a week on Al's calendar became five, and Al converted his private practice into a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And it was people like Peter and other record labels now that were footing the bill and covering the expenses of this nonprofit so artists could continue to come back, you know, time and time again for free. Like just totally unheard of, right? This group of people that had really not been invested in now all of a sudden had someone that they could trust that could provide them counsel as they're navigating this really unique journey. And what I love about Al is, you know, and and I think for a lot of us, we're trying to figure out how is it that we show up? Because I think all of us believe we we're solving a problem for people, right? Yep, right. So we believe in our product. And, you know, I think what what I love about Al is he wasn't really asking the, hey, what's in it for me? Me as a counselor, how am I going to grow my practice? He actually started with more of that who am I here for mindset. It's it's the, the what problem can I solve for somebody else? He was showing up to solve problems for others. And I think for a lot of us, that's the path that we need to start heading down. And maybe you're doing some of that today, but maybe you're hearing this and this is further confirmation to double down on that investment of energy and effort. How can you do all that you do in service of somebody else? How can you solve a problem for others? You know, it really set Al down a really beautiful path. And you know, while in counseling, there's, uh, you know, there's some, you know, it, it's all anonymous, right? So several artists, though, have kind of come out on their own and just spoken of the power that this is and the impact that this has made in their lives. And, you know, Porter's Call is, you know, it's what it's called. It continues to gain a bunch of traction. And so many artists in Nashville have been impacted by the work that Al did, the decision that he made to not try to go out and make a bunch of money as a private practice guy, but actually to convert to a, to a nonprofit and go a, a little bit of a different path. So I think the challenge in there is, you know, for all of us, it's, you know, are you showing up to solve a problem for somebody else? Because I think that can really lead us down a really beautiful path. Tim, again, awesome book. The book is The Secret Society of Success. One of the, I don't know if I'd say a quote, but a blurb that you have in the book that is highlighted is success is in the process. What does that mean? When I worked with Don, there were several books that I was able to be a part of releasing. You know, it's him writing these books, but so much of our team was collaborating to market these things, put them out into the world. And there was a, about 10 days after Don's book, Scary Close, came out was the day that we were expecting a phone call from the publisher. And on that phone call, the publisher was going to say whether or not we hit a particular bestsellers list, right? Which for a lot of people is a pretty big deal. So looking forward to the call, Don gets the telephone call, he hangs up, 
raises his hands in the air, and he's like, we hit number five on the New York Times. It was the highest any of his books had ever been on the New York Times. So it was a pretty big deal. We're all high five and hugging. I mean, it was pretty fun. And then something really interesting happened. We all went back to work. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Right. And, you know, I think you could look at that and, you know, somebody could say, you know, we're dysfunctional. We don't know how to actually celebrate. And I'm like, I could see that perspective. But to me, that felt like a moment of health. That was, hey, we, we acknowledge the win, but after a few minutes, like, what else are we going to do? Like, the validation, the accolade is nice, but it's not what we were doing it for. We wanted to just show up and do the work regardless of if it ever hit a list or not, right? So this idea of, you know, focusing on the process, focus on the process, not the result. Because in a business, a lot of us have probably heard these terms. Focus on lead measures, not lag measures. You know, that was really popularized by the book Four Disciplines of Execution, a a book from Franklin Covey. Mm -hmm. You know, the the lag measure is the number of books sold, right? It's the revenue at the end of the month. You can't do anything to impact that number after you get it. But what you can control is the lead measure. What are the levers that you pulled? What are the activities you engaged in to impact that lag measure? And so our team's just so focused on the lead measures, just showing up and doing the work, controlling what we can control, surrendering the outcome, right? And, you know, when I was uh, working at Apple, Steve Jobs was CEO, and I remember him saying, you know, the joy is in the journey. And here's a guy who had achieved all the success that you could imagine, you know, in running a massive company, the guy had more money than he would ever know what to do with. And with that quote, he's saying to us, guys, I've figured something out. It's not the destination. It's the journey. The joy is in the journey. And I think for so many of us, we're almost waiting to turn the corner, waiting to hit that next plateau, and then we will have arrived. I'm so sorry to tell you, you will never arrive. That is not what this is all about, right? So I'm learning and have learned from people like that Steve Jobs quote, joy is in the journey. Focus on the process, not the result. Focus on the lead measures, not the lag measures. Because I think that's when we are willing to do the work for the joy of the work itself. Not, you know, being caught up with a spotlight mindset, not worrying about that attention and recognition and, you know, maybe how others will perceive us, but instead learning to live into our own definition of success and letting that take us on a path wherever it may take us. But these are the things that I'm learning from the secret society, learning to define success differently. Because in a world that says to be successful, it's stepping into the spotlight, climbing the ladder. I think so many of us and myself included is asking like, is that it though? Surely there's another way. And there is, and this is it. It's things like helping others win, asking who am I here for? falling in love with the work and not worrying so much about if you ever get the recognition or the credit, you know, walking with humble confidence and doing your part, serving your customers, and hopefully building some really beautiful things as a result. The, as you were talking through the destination piece, the only real destination we ever get to is death, right? Like that's the end. That's the destination. And not to make this morbid, but you know, if you're Focused on, and I had a, I was fortunate enough to work in uh, at O'Reilly Media, so Tim O'Reilly's company. And one of the lessons that he shared in how he failed was that you know, life and business is not a series of visits to the gas station. That's not. It's you know you've got to go get gas periodically to continue to give yourself fuel to keep keep moving things forward. But it's not the stops from gas station to gas station, it's all of the experiences, the process, the building as you go through. And if you, the only other thing I'd want to add to this is if you're in a situation where you are not enjoying the process, make some decisions. You can get out. It's tough. You can go find other places where you enjoy the process so that you're inside an organization where people have your back, not where people are all stepping Mm -hmm. over each other. Like you've got an opportunity to get out there. So if you're not enjoying the process, there's, there's an opportunity to, to change. Tim, awesome conversation. 
Man, I've had so much fun. I, this is the thing I am so passionate about, and people can probably hear it in my voice. I can't think of a better thing to do with my life as long as I'm able to, how many other opportunities I have to talk about this, because I think this idea of defining success really does make all the difference. And yet it seems so simple. All of us can do it. you know. So I'm hoping that more of us can do more of it. Where can people find out more about what you're working on? And we'll include links and in, in show notes and, and make sure that we've got those in there. But where, where would you like to send people? Yeah. So if you go to secretsocietybook.com, it has a link to, you know, all the retailers there. It's available on target.com, Amazon, you know, wherever you buy books. And there's also places there if people want to connect with me on social media. But the most important thing I think is get the book, start to ask yourself these questions, immerse yourself in this conversation, because I just think it can make a pretty radical difference in your life. You know, I'd love to do this too. I had a North Star for me in, in all of this was this quote that I heard and would love to read it here as we close. Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be. Some of you will perhaps occupy remarkable positions. Perhaps some of you will become famous by your pens or as artists. But I know one thing, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. And I'm like, that's it right that's it that's the journey that i hope all of us will go on tim again amazing conversation if you know of someone out there who would enjoy this discussion get value out of the conversation please share it with them let tim and i know via all of the socials linkedin twitter instagram let us know directly so that we can comment and amplify that sales is a thinking process Business is a thinking process. Life is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about your process? 